At this time, let's put our hands together for the Reverend Dr. Marshall Hatch, the pastor of New Mount Pilgrim Missionary Baptist Church. Amen. Come on, y'all. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Both. Both. You got it. All right. Thank God for Reverend Bochamp and for his great work and members of Elmhurst College and everybody who is here today. Saw Reverend Greer here today. Uh, it is a blessing to be here. We had two services, one at 8 and one at 11, and did a special commemoration message on this date 10 years ago. And so uh, this event is, a, I think, a very meaningful event in that we have, of course, representatives of different faiths coming together on 9-11 to emphasize and make the point that ours is a country of religious pluralism and one of the great gifts that we can give to the world is to show that even though we may have particular faiths that we all work together for the common good you want to know why somebody asked me why you supposed to say why because that's the American way give ourselves a hand. That's the American way. That's what we do. We work together for the common good. So we want to welcome you to the New Mount Pilgrim Missionary Baptist Church. This is West Garfield Park. Um, our congregation is probably the largest congregation in West Garfield Park. This is the old St. Mel Catholic Church building. And so we have, um, we have baptized it, if you know what I mean. You know, it's now a Baptist church. Uh, at one time, this, um, this uh, parish was the largest of the Irish Catholic congregations in the city, uh, the old St. Mel, and so it always has had uh, some interesting architecture and stained glass. And then our congregation has been worshiping here since 1993, and we added our own touch of stained glass windows so far. So the one here is out of the old root scene and that's the baby being held up and that's the way we bless babies in our tradition. We hold the baby up as if to behold one greater than ourselves and one that uh, is, is the newest member of the community. And then <clears throat> this east window, so that's north and the north star, this uh, east window is facing the Atlantic, and it is a commemoration of the, the people who did not survive the transatlantic slave trade. Those are the slave uh, packing uh, ship icon in the center of that window. The largest display of the slave ship packing icon in the world is that window. And uh, it is, of course, uh, we put it in in 2000. Ma'afa, the word means the great calamity and how Africans experienced what we call the transatlantic slave trade. And so all of it points to the fact that every one of us has a story and that story is important. And all of those stories put together, of course, is the American story. Out of the many, there is one great story of human freedom. And so we thank God for every one of you. We welcome you here today. We got an awesome jazz band and all of that. And so we're going to commemorate and we're going to have a good time at the same time. And the church said, Amen. 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 And Amen. God bless you. As you may know, that our goal is to try to reach the community. So what I'm going to say is I'm going to ask uh, uh, Pastor Greer to pray first, and then we're going to try to send out some of our peer leaders to start working in the community. And the rest of us will remain for the remainder of this service at this time to try to go ahead and move this part forward as we do the commemorative efforts. Pastor Greer. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Dr. Beauchamp, and thank you, Dr. Hatch, for allowing us to come into this beautiful edifice here in Godfield Park, amen? And so I'm glad to see each and every one of your face. Let's pray. Turn to God our Father, we come now. And God, we come on a, 
on a day, Lord God, in America that we remember. And now, God, we pray for the families of those who suffered at the vicious attacks over 10 years ago. God, we pray for the children. We pray for the survivors. Lord God, over 10 years ago, freedom was attacked. But God, because of your grace and mercy, America has risen again. And God, today we represent diversity in this place. God, we ask now that you bless this endeavor that we're doing. We pray now, Lord God, that you bless partners for peace. And God, we thank you now, Father, there's a concern from the young men and young women in this place to reach out to the community to provide health care, to provide fresh fruit, and just to be here. And now, God, we ask you now in the name of Jesus, Lord God, to wrap your arms of protection around us. Bless this church, bless the administration. Keep us strong. Let us continue to look to you. We ask all this now in Jesus' name. Amen. For those of you who don't remember, Pastor Greer was the host for last year's event. So we're glad to have him working with us yet again. Uh, it was Dr. Marshall Hatch that was at our last year's event, one of our speakers who overheard this outstanding jazz band and then welcomed us over into this wonderful edifice here. So we're grateful. Now, uh, I don't know how to say it enough, but folks, when a man opens up his house and lets you come in and let you have freedoms, you need to say thank you. So put your hands together one more time for Reverend Dr. Marshall Hatch. And let's thank our good brother, Reverend Pastor Stephen Greer, for share, sharing with us yet again. All the students that have on blue shirts line up in front of me right here. All the students in blue shirts line up in front. There you go. Okay, I need Bob, Laura, and Mark to go to the back door. Bob, Laura, and Mark. All right. We're going to have a couple of people who have said they would be willing to go and, and work with you students. So um, let's see who's over there. The gentleman on the end, what's your name? That would be you. What's your name? We are. We are? Okay. Uh, would I have Jordan and we are go to the back door first? And I would like to get um, two students who would like to go with them and help canvas the neighbors. Just any two students, jump up now. Jump, get going. There you go. Angelica and Jasmine, go behind them. Angelica and Jasmine, oh, we got two Jasmines. Jasmine number one and Angelica, there we go. And give me two more students to go with them. Any two students who would like to help with canvassing? Any two? Thank you, any two. There we go, we got Lena and we got Virginia, all right. Then we got Chris and Jasmine number two. Walk down here, and I need two more students to go with them, all right. There we go. Robin Cook, any two. Mo, hold up. Robin's going to go with this next group. You see? Okay, Robin. All right. Let me get Genesis, and I don't want you. Um, I feel so loved. No, not you. Him. Uh, let me get um, Colin. Come here, Colin. You go with Genesis. We might get some work done this way. Colin and Genesis. You two go down now. Can you take pictures on the road? Can Kaiser's take it? I mean, can one of you guys help me? Thank you, Kaiser. Appreciate you. Can I get two volunteers to go with Kaiser and Genesis? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Now, Maureen, and uh, what's your name? Jeremy. You two go this way. I need two students to go with them. Any two students who would like to go canvas the neighborhood with Maureen and Jeremy? Any volunteers? Oh, we're starting to get a little weak now. There we go. We've got two volunteers. Amen. We got Megan and Stanley. You two go next. I need two volunteers with Megan and Stanley. Megan, I need one more. One more. Give me one more. Thank you, sir. Oh, we got the two shorties. We got Carly and Kelly. Who wants to go with Carly and Kelly? Go ahead. I need two volunteers to go up. Come up. I got two right here. Go ahead, right now. There you go. And then we have Faisal and Jeremy. No, you three can stick together. Go down here. We got Claire, Faisal, and Jeremy. I need two volunteers to go with them. 
Two volunteers. We have two? There's one. I need one more. Get one. Here's another. Thank you, Carly. All right, do me this favor. For the sake of the remainder of this time, I want to ask this group right here, will you fill up this front portion here? Would you get up and come closer? Get up and come closer? Thank you. And for the sake of sanity, thank you. Thank you. Don't panic, folks. This is going to be working real smoothly. It's going to work. What I'm going to ask at this time is we have a special rendition of some music here. And Trudy is here with her daughter, Trina. And I want to ask them if they would come at this time and bless us with the greatest love of all. Let's put our hands together for Trudy and Trina. While they're preparing themselves, um, we're also blessed today to have with us our chaplain. Wave your hand, Chaplain Matheny. He's one of my favorites. There you go. We're just so glad he's here with us. Amen. Amen. That was wonderful. As soon as I get those people out of my building, we'll be fine. Okay. Also on the other side helping us out is Mr. Josiah Montgomery, so thank you, Josiah. If you guys know this one, you can sing along. I don't need to be up here all by myself, really. I believe the children are future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Show them all the beauty they possess inside. Give them a sense of pride to make it easier. Let the children's laughter Remind us how we used to be. Everybody searching for a hero. People need someone to look up to. I never found anyone who fulfilled my need. A lonely place to be. And so I learned to depend on me. I decided long ago never to walk in anyone's shadow. If I fail, if I succeed, at least I live as I believe. No matter what they take from me, they can take away my dignity. Love of all is happening to me. Learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all. Learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all. I believe the children are future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Show them all the beauty they possess inside. A simple place sorry, to hide. And so I learned to depend on me. I decided long ago never to walk in anyone's shadow. If I fail, if I succeed, at least I live as I believe. No matter what they take from me, they can take away my dignity. Because the greatest love 
love of all is happening to me. I found the greatest love of all inside of me. Threw my daughter off. I'm sorry. <laughs> Ran it by chance. We'll just call this an ending, and we hope you guys are going to have a great time today and enjoy yourself. Thank you. Sorry about that. That was all my fault. Thank you. I lost it. Sorry, Ron. Ladies and gentlemen, that was my coordinator from the Niebuhr Center, Trudy Salida. Put your hands together for her. And her lovely daughter, Trina, on guitar. Both are current students. Trudy's a current student at the college, and Trina's a graduate of the college. And uh, we're, we're looking forward to a graduation next year, and we're looking forward to us sharing together even more in the future. At this next opportunity, we are really pleased to have some of our students here who have been volunteering to help us pull together some of the food downstairs. And since Trudy's going that way, what I was looking for was a, about 10 students that would go with her to help do some of the preparation of the, of the fresh produce. Do we have volunteers from 10 students? Let me get, ooh, wait, wait, let me, one, two, three, stand up and move quickly. One, two, three, four, five, six, that's six. One, those two back there. Okay, I think I've got my grouping. I think I got my grouping. Come on. Go ahead, that would do it, that would do it, that would do it. That would help her out. Now, while they're doing that, I want to ask all of you over there to come over here and fill in their gaps. There you go, just keep moving, keep this party going, amen. For those of you who don't know, we're being broadcast through Blue Jay TV. It will be televised later, and you'll get a chance to look at yourself on YouTube, laugh at yourself, smile at yourself. So we'll be looking to see who really was serious and who really wanted to volunteer. We'll be... It's going to be fun. Don't worry. At this time, we have been honored to have with us a special guest. But I want uh, Professor Enama Hawk to introduce her. Professor Hawk, would you come and say a few words about our guest who's coming up next? As uh, today's reflections will be offered by people from different faith tradition, so from Muslim tradition we have Sister Amina Saeed, uh, who is by profession an attorney law, and she was the uh, executive director of Council of Islamic Organizations in Chicago area. The Council of Islamic Organizations is an umbrella organization which represents all Chicago mosques. And we have about 150 small and big mosques in the large Chicago area, which is about 30 to 40 mile radius from the downtown. Uh, and Sister Amina Saeed is prominent member of Muslim community. Uh, she is a second generation who were born and raised here to the parents who migrated from India. She is a very qualified person and has offered leadership and inspiration to our young people. So we are pleased that she is here and she will share her thoughts with you about 9-11 and where do we go from here. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, greetings of peace. It's a pleasure to be here in this beautiful, beautiful sanctuary today, and I am honored to be here. Um, I think Professor Enamel Huck um, was too gracious, and, and he talked about me being, I think, younger. But um, what I was going to start with is that I wasn't going to be turning 40 in a week. And people usually don't share that information, but here I am sharing that. And I'm not embarrassed to admit it. But um, 
It's something that I have been dreading for the past year for the same reason that many people my age start dreading turning 40. You start thinking about your life to date and what have, what have I accomplished? What have I done with my first 40 years? And am I going to get another 40 years? Has God going to give me another 40 years to do anything more than what I have done and, and to the extent that I've had failings be able to rectify those? These are all things that I've been thinking about for the last year, you know, successes, failures, goals, the road ahead. But as I do that, inevitably, my thoughts have constantly drifted to another person, my cousin Nasima, who died at the World Trade Center on the morning of um, September 11, 2001, along with nearly 3,000 other innocent people who were murdered that day in New York and at the Pentagon and in DC, I mean, in Pennsylvania. <clears throat> Along with most of you here, I'm sure, I watched the tragedy unfold on TV um, where I worked at the time, the Cook County Public Guardian's Office, where many of us um, attorneys gathered together, um, crowded around a small TV screen to watch as things unfolded and all of us were you know, thinking, reflecting out loud about who we knew who happened to be in D.C. that day or who would have been in New York. And my thoughts turned to my cousin. <clears throat> but it just didn't occur to me that she could be a victim. She, she was a survivor. She was someone who climbed mountains. She had just returned from a mountain climbing trip, which she really enjoyed doing. <clears throat> and... In fact, her laundry was still folded in a laundry basket when family members went to her apartment afterwards. She was really accomplished. She was highly intelligent. She was born in Pakistan, moved to the United States to California in her teens, put herself through college, put herself through a master's in business school at Columbia, and she was successful. She worked for an elite company at the World Trade Center. So I didn't think that it could affect her. Today, she would have been 38. You know, just, I mean, I'm sorry, she would have been 48 today. She died when she was 38, a year younger than I am now. And I can't help but think, if she were here today, having gone through most of her 40s, what advice would she give me about navigating through my 40s? And sadly, I will never know. Um, Nasima's chances were um, probably minimal for survival that day. She worked for a company called Fiduciary Trust International, which, along with its parent company, lost 87 employees at the World Trade Center. Their offices were in the South Tower, which was the second tower that was hit. And so from the time that the first plane hit the first tower at 8.46 a.m., there were exactly 16 minutes for people who were in the second tower to think about what they were going to do. And they say that those who survived were the ones who immediately just walked out of whatever meeting they were, were in, whatever they were doing, didn't go back for a purse and didn't go back for a cell phone. I don't know if Nasima did, but she wasn't the ones, one of the ones who made it. In fact, her offices were um, directly where the second plane, plane hit, on floors 94 through 97. So, you know, I, I, as I, looking back at the time, I sat at the TV screen watching what was unfolding as we all did from outside the World Trade Center. None of us really knew what was happening inside. And now I think about what those final moments must have been like for her and for all those other people inside the World Trade Center after that second, after the first plane and the second plane hit, and they contemplated the reality of the situation. You know, she was she and all those other people were doomed to death that day. But the rest of us have been living with the consequences of that day. <clears throat> Osama bin Laden and his ilk 
wanted to bring the financial world to its knees when they chose to attack the United States 10 years ago. I'm sure that they didn't care that they killed Nasima and other Muslims, even though they professed to carry out these attacks in the name of Islam. And they didn't care that there were poor people there whose families depended on their every paycheck, waiters and um, maids who worked in the facilities. And they didn't care whether you know, if someone had a loved one. Um, they didn't care of whether people who died that day were people of faith or not. Apparently all they cared about was it wasn't the same brand of faith that they believe in. I wonder though if they realize that American Muslims would be part of the rebuilding process and that young people like the ones who are here today from Elmhurst College would study hard so that they can contribute to America's financial well-being <clears throat> and that what they wanted to achieve would not be achieved, the destruction of the United States. And in so many ways, in the last 10 years, you know, I think that our patriotism as a country has grown and that we have been so much more unified as a result of what happened, which is exactly what they didn't want. You know, despite the naysayers, despite the people who are out there who claim that Islam is a terrible faith, I'm sorry, I have a cold, that's why I sound this way, um, those who have given up on faith altogether and believe that faith is the root of all evil, um, I think that the, the, the more positive things that we have seen come out of 9-11 are clearly from the people of faith who have gathered together in, in gatherings like this over and over again to reaffirm our unitedness as Americans and all the good things that we can do together and who have united in service, whether it's at the call of President Barack Obama or for their own internal reasons to perform community service. <clears throat> you know, there are so many lessons to be learned about 9-11 that have come out of the good um, things that have happened since then, but also the bad things that have happened since that day, the, the hate crimes, <clears throat> the subjugation of certain communities, <clears throat> but I'm not going to dwell on those. Um, I'm not going to talk about the, um, all, the, all the lessons learned of 9-11 because there are, frankly, too many for us to talk about here quickly now, but also because I believe that that's something, that reflection and remembrance process is something that each one of us who lived through that day needs to go through ourselves internally. And hopefully all of you are doing that today or have done it at some point in the last week when we've been hearing so many stories, reading stories about remembrance and about all the, the heroes on that day. <clears throat> For my part, I put the practice of law on hold after 9-11 and I embraced community service on a full-time basis <clears throat> as I became the director, the first full-time director of the Council of Islamic Organizations of Greater Chicago. It was because I couldn't shake the memory of Nasima, and I didn't want her death to be in vain. But I also thought about what American Muslims were going through. In particular, there's one image that is forever etched in my memory. It is a meeting I had with my uncle and aunt, Nasima's parents, as they stopped at O'Hare on their way back to California, where they live. Um, after a memorial service in New York. There we were standing in Terminal 1, the United Terminal, and we were off to the side. Like me, my aunt covered her hair. She's, she's now deceased. She, she died a few years ago on September 10th, um, the eve of the death of Nasima's anniversary, and um, her parting words 
were that she was going to go meet Nasima again. <clears throat> but that day at O'Hare, I, I stood between my elderly uncle and aunt, who were then in their 70s, coming back from a memorial service in New York, <clears throat> and I saw the sad look on their faces as they tried to process their daughter's death. And then I looked up and I saw the lines, the security lines that they would go through to go back into the terminal. <clears throat> and I saw the skepticism and the hatred that people directed at them. My uncle has a beard and my aunt wears a scarf, so they're very outwardly Muslim. <clears throat> And I thought at that moment that this is just not fair. This is not right, and this isn't American. This is not how it's supposed to be. They're in mourning, and yet, as they go through this airport, and as they went through the airport in New York, most likely, and as they will in, at LAX, um, they're treated with suspicion. So at that time, I vowed that I couldn't sit by and, and let this disintegrate our our city and our country, I had to do on my part. And that's when I decided to put law on hold and <clears throat> practice um, full time on, uh, com do community service full time. I embraced my new work in advocating for American Muslims um, wholeheartedly. I threw myself into it in media relations, interfaith relations, government relations, um, <clears throat> you name it. I was doing it to the point where I was literally never home and my young three-year-old son was starting to call my mom, mom, <laughs> um, instead of me because I was just never around. But that's how passionate about this I was and, and firm in my belief that if we could just explain to people that Muslims really aren't bad people and that the people who did these evil actions don't represent the rest of us, that they, they aren't us and we aren't them, that things would change, things would be okay. But in this whole process of, of living this new job day in and day out for over four years, it was I who actually ended up growing a lot and learning a lot. And one of the things I learned about was how much the Muslim community in Chicago lives in isolation and how much it's American Muslims who need to change in order to get past 9-11 and for us to all heal together. So I went from advocating on behalf of the community, which I continue to do, but in addition to that, I started criticizing my own community and telling them, you're not involved. How do you expect people to listen to you and hear what you're saying when they don't even know you and you're not making an attempt to get to know them? This message has taken a long time to get through. And frankly, it's younger people, like the people in the crowd here today, who have embraced it, who have understood it, and who have started to act on it, and who, I think, represent hope for the future. So, you know, I, I believe that um, <clears throat> that change is inevitable, that, that the American Muslim community will one day be accepted part, as part of our mainstream community. Um, it won't happen, it, it, it hasn't happened in 10 years, even though many people in the Muslim community thought it would. Um, I think perhaps in the next 10 years, we are um, on that road because of the efforts of young people like those here who are engaging actively in community service and talking openly about who they are as Muslims their share, their concerns, their fears, and who are not afraid to get to know others. And I think it's also because others, younger generations, others of, of other faith traditions, are looking to their Muslim counterparts and saying, I want to get to know you. I want to know who you are, what you represent. 
And to me, this is the message that is most critical for us to contemplate um, together today, um, especially in light of the service project that um, the students have embarked on. And that is that we all need to make genuine attempts to befriend one another. When I worked at the Council of Islamic Organizations, many times I would have um, people come up to me and say, we're not comfortable with our Muslim neighbors because we don't really know them. True, we meet with them in an in a faith setting. We may have a dialogue with them on a monthly basis, but we don't really know them and it's hard to really make friends with someone if you don't know them that well. And that made a lot of sense to me. I think that um, we need to go beyond interfaith dialogue. We need to go beyond just coming together for community service. That's a great start, but what we need to do is befriend one another in a way that we would any other friend who is, who is like us. So for young people, that you ha would hang out together. Don't just you know, get together for a community service project. Hopefully today, when you leave here, invite one of the other people that, who is here with you, who you may not know that well, to go out to dinner with you. Go see a movie together. Invite them over to your place to just hang and talk and eat together. When you enjoy a meal together, that breaks a lot of barriers. And if you can continue that conversation, you'll find that you have so much more in common with each other than differences. And hopefully that will lead to a lifelong friendship that you will continue to maintain as you grow older. So um, the last thing I want to leave you with is something that I heard recited yesterday at the Council of Metropolitan Chicago Religious Leaders 9-11 um, Memorial Gathering at Daly Plaza, a surah, uh, which is a, a, a chapter from the Quran, which I was really moved by, and as I thought about it, I thought, yes, this, this is really in keeping for the theme of reflection and remembrance, and I wanted to share it with you. It's called The Expansion. Have we not expanded thee thy breast and removed from thee thy burden? The which did gall thy back and raised high the esteem in which thou art held. So verily, with every difficulty there is relief. Verily, with every difficulty, there is relief. Therefore, when thou art free from thine immediate task, still labor hard, and to thy Lord turn all attention, to turn all thy attention. <clears throat> I think this is especially important because the last 10 years have shown us that it is faith that can pull us through, that, that can help us overcome the difficulties and so if we continue, each of us in our respective faith traditions, turn to your Lord and seek guidance from your Lord and know that, you know, when with every difficulty there is relief, that a time will come that we will overcome 9-11, God willing. So thank you for your listening to me today. and. Um, congratulations to Elmhurst College on your service project today. Thank you. We are in need of nursing students to go downstairs now. The, they're looking for you to get ready to for, get space for the next part. And while they're shifting, I want to ask if the jazz band would come up and fill in this gap up here. Help me out, jazz band. Help me out. First year seminar students, come take your places now because you're up. And if the jazz band could just fill in this hole right here, just fill in this hole right here. I appreciate that. Piano's over this way. Yeah. Oh, you can if you want to use this one. Either way. Either way.
If you guys could come sit over here. Thank you. I just want to fill in the gap. That's all. I need your spaces, your bodies. Thank you very kindly. We'll get you up in a second before you know it. I don't know if I would think. I want to bring to your attention there is a, a group of students that I have on our campus, and it's called the First Year Seminar Students. This group of students is. Um, part of a new program that we have on our campus, a pilot program to educate all freshmen to go through an experience. For those of you who are here hearing about this for the first time, uh, this particular course that I teach is called a Exploring World Music. So there's 20 students that signed up to, for this course, of which many of them have some type of musical talent or gift. So I asked them if they would ki come by and share today some of their talent and share with us some of the things that they can do and so you get a chance to hear them. They're gonna perform the song um, uh, Imagine by John Lennon.
Come on, give them another round of applause. This is our freshman, amen. I love it. I, I'm, a, I'm a proud teacher today. And my co-teacher is here, Bev McNulty. Wave your hand, Bev. Saw her just whipping her camera around. She's got a whole bunch of pictures on you guys. At this time, our student government president is here, and we're going to hear words from Jake Metting at this time. Mr. Metting will come and share words from a student's perspective. That was really good. Congratulations, guys. So now I have to follow that up. So um, I sat there watching TV, and my eyes were transfixed on the image of a burning building. The only thought in my head was that this seemed too big for a small single engine plane to have made. That's what the news reports were saying happened. As I watched the reporters ask eyewitnesses uh, what they saw, they said that they saw an accident, that a plane had flown into the building. And all of them kept repeating the phrase of, it's a clear sky out, how could this have happened? Or there must have been something with the pilot because this doesn't happen. As my stepdad drove me to school, we were listening to the radio and we heard that the second plane hit the second tower. I will always remember uh, what my stepdad said next. Oh, this is a terrorist attack. The sheer strength that those words had on a sixth grader, I couldn't believe that he would say it so passively. But now I look back and I realize it was one of the bravest things he ever did. He remained calm so that I would remain calm. Those of us who were arriving to school later had to inform people what was going on. I feel that nowadays we're spoiled. We have communication at our fingertips and could easily hear anything that's going on in a second. But back then, my teachers who had arrived early to plan their day had no clue what was going on. So they had to be informed by the students who were arriving. I remember sitting in school and having the teachers say we needed to go on with our day. And every once in a while you would hear reports of what was happening. That the Pentagon had been hit. That they had grounded all planes. It wasn't until I got home that day that I found out that not only had there been a fourth plane crash, but that both towers had collapsed too. Our next door neighbors at the time were Muslim and they came over to apologize to my mom. They apologized to her. They said, this isn't what our religion means and this isn't what we stand for. Looking back on that day, I will never forget the feeling of one nation together to support each other and to help each other through this arduous time if I could have you take away three things from that day, it would be this. Faith in the support of your fellow man, hope for a better tomorrow, and love for your fellow man. And I close with one of my favorite quotes from Corinthians. It reads, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Well said, Jake, well said. At this time, I'm pleased because I get to introduce someone who's very near and dear to me. Uh, you might have guessed it by the last name, but this is my wife. So Laverne Beauchamp, come on down. She's also a student at the college as well, uh, currently working on her bachelor's. So we're happy to have her. So you folks be kind to my wife. Put your hands together and encourage her. All right, looks like our son wants to sing too.
thank Brother Josiah for accompanying me. It's not easy <laughs> to just hear him cry, but we're just waiting patiently. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just too little of. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. No, not just for some but for everyone we don't need another mountain there are mountains and hillsides enough to climb there are oceans and rivers enough to cross to last till the end of time what the world needs now is love sweet love it's the only thing that there's just too little love what the world needs now is love sweet love no not just for some but for everyone no we don't need another mountain there are mountains and hillsides enough to climb. There are rivers and oceans enough to cross. Enough to last till the end of time. Is love, sweet love, it's the only thing that there's just too little love of what the world, what it needs now is love, sweet love, no, not just for some but for everyone no not just for some but for every one reach out and touch somebody's hand and make this world a better place if you can just reach out and touch somebody's hand and make this world a better place we can do it can't we if we can just hold your neighbor's hand reach out and touch somebody's hand and make this world a better place why don't we stand up we could use a little exercise if you can reach out and touch 
somebody's hand. Let's raise them up, make this world a better place. Yeah, 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 if you can, come on and reach out and touch somebody's hand. Make this world a better place. If you can, can you sing it with me? Reach out and touch, yeah. We can do it, we can do it. Reach out and touch somebody's and make this world. Yes, if you can, can. All right, give yourselves a hand. We can do it, we can do it. Wow, wasn't that exciting? <laughs> Hallelujah. If you folks just let go and let God, you'll have a great time today. Amen. Uh, at this time, I'm going to invite our college chaplain to come for a brief second or so with us to get us in the right frame of thinking as we close out this portion. Uh, we're getting closer to the time where we'll be going down and sharing a little bit more with our neighbors and our loved ones. And we want you all to engage, okay? We want you to engage, but we're going to also have a great jazz band performing. So we don't want you to just get up and walk out and leave them, but we want to engage and try to figure out ways to support and encourage. So at this time, we're going to bring our college chaplain, and he will not only have a couple things, but closing remarks and benediction for this portion. And then we have our great Reverend here, Riley, right, who's going to help us towards the end of this to wrap it all up. Reverend H. Scott Matheny. Put your hands together for him. Okay. Thank you, Ron. For those of you who are in the halls waking up this morning, I hope the bells maybe caught your attention at 8.46 a.m. We started ringing at 8.46 and then at 9.03. Amina? Like you, the college lost a dear member of its community. Bill Johnson, a member of our class, lost his wife, who was also a graduate of Columbia University, like your cousin. I went back to do that memorial for the university and for the college, and he specifically asked that Elmhurst College remember by ringing bells, and we did. And like last night, as we gathered in Daly Plaza, and listen to the joys of what it means to be one people. This nation, Muslims, Jews, Christians. I mean, I, I'm gonna ask you if you would come with me up, please, to light this candle as we light candles for those who have lost loved ones, all of us who have lost folks, and what we have gained, and why we are doing this here. Will you join me, please, ma'am? And as we light this candle, come on up, please. I invite us to remain in silence, and then I will call us back to gather. thanks to the holy as you understand that as we are here in this beloved church to work and serve. May their lives be a blessing and may we be blessed and continue to be a blessing.
We do not do this in the vacuum. There are young men and women around the nation that took up the call by President Obama. Indeed, our president is serving soup in a soup kitchen in Washington, D.C. this day. There are 250 colleges and universities, including Elmhurst College, that took a challenge by the president, and I took Reverend Beauchamp this summer to the White House to work with those chaplains and those presidents around the nation to do exactly what you guys are doing today, to figure out how to serve on this day, 9-11, as an act of hope, faith of multiple stripes and no faith, and to gather together and to think and be and do what you all are doing. The jazz band will lift up music and does what it does best. We will serve and do what we're called to do. And so the blessing of this day and my final benediction stands in a particular tradition that is ultimately not mine. It's out of the Jewish tradition. But I understand it through Professor Hawk and through others in my own community as similar because it has roots in the Quran and in the Christian Bible. But there's this amazing story that goes like this out of the Mishnah. There's this rabbi, he's beloved, and on the eve of Shabbat, the holy day of the week, he leaves his community and goes into the woods and vanishes and then comes back. And he does this week after week for Shabbat on the eve of the holy night. And finally, the community of faith, the congregation, says we will send somebody secretly behind him and we'll watch. Where did he go? The rabbi goes off, is followed, comes back, and goes home to be with his wife and family to prepare for Shabbat. The congregation gathers around the person that was the spy and says, our beloved rabbi, where did he go? Did he go to heaven? Did he go to heaven? And this amazing man said, no, he did not go to heaven. He went much higher. Every night when he went, he took care of a non-Jewish woman who was disabled and swept for her and fed her and gathered wood for her and then came back to be the rabbi. Each of you are going to be the rabbi, the Amman, the pastor. You are going to go higher than heaven by what you do here now by what you play, you will go higher than heaven. Thank you all for coming. Reverend. I'm Reverend Warren Riley. I'm one of the associate ministers here at New Mount Pilgrim Missionary Baptist Church. And this has just been an outstanding event. Um, Partners for Peace. And I'm excited because uh, I am actually a 20-year veteran. I retired from the Air Force. I know exactly where I was in 1991 during that time. So it's actually uh, very touching and, and uh, very meaningful to me because uh, I didn't lose anybody on that day. But from that time forward, for the next 10 years, I lost a lot of close friends in support of fighting for homeland security or for freedom of this place and what we enjoy today. So I'm excited that the young people are here today and that you are actually taking part in making, making this land a better land. And so I would just ask that you would just continue to be encouraged, that you would tell your friends that regardless of what your belief is, we all have one thing in common. We live in the great land of the United States. And so I thank everyone for everything that's transpired so far today. It has been so touching. I'm well educated now. Um, and I just want you to be encouraged to continue to do better things. This is an awesome, awesome testimony of what we can do when we come together. Even though September 11, 2001, we changed the way that we live, but we didn't change who we are. We're still Americans. This is still a great place to live, and we're still the land of the free and the home of the brave. So thank you so much. 
Don't let anybody take away your joy. And so I just want to, on behalf of Pastor Hatch and New Mount Pilgrim Missionary Baptist Church, we're excited to have you here. You're always welcomed here, not for any special occasion, but anytime you want to come, you can come here on Sunday or our doors are open seven days a week. So um, w without any further ado, thank you so much. Give yourselves a round of applause because I'm excited to have young people uh, coming together on one great occasion regardless of what your belief is. And I hope that the newspapers print that. Tell somebody, run and tell that, right? Amen. God bless you. Well, jazz band, now you can take the stage and get ready. It's your turn to shine. Um, we have also have some food for those who are here and some opportunities for health screening as well. If you want to come down, you can go on this side right over here. We're ready for you, and while the band and others are playing, we're just going to get excited and enjoy ourselves. Um, we are so happy to have so many people here from a variety of backgrounds, and there's a, a, there's a lady here from a reporter who is trying to pull some things together. Um, can I get the representative from the Albanian mosque to come? They would like to have a conversation with you down the stairs. Reverend Riley, could you go and represent your church? And Amina, would you come as well? Yes. Now, folks, you're about to be given a treat by an awesome band under the direction of the Grammy Award winning Doug Beach. I like saying that. So, folks, I want you to enjoy this. If you want to move over, get in front. If you want to do that, feel free. You're at home here, okay? Don't feel like you're scared or timid. No one's going to bite you. You're safe in this confines, okay? Feel free. You're going to enjoy this. Come on over here. Oh, 